full care what tongue can recite it breathes in the air it shines in the light it streams from the hills it descends to the plain and sweetly distills in the dew and the
Well, if you got your Bibles, do me a favor, hold them up. Say, I believe, I believe that my Bible, my Bible is, the Word of God. is the Word of God. I will love it, I will, love it, I will learn it, I will learn and I will live it, I will live it to, the glory of God. to the glory of God. Amen. That's our commitment to the Word of God. Join me in a word of prayer as we, as we uh, pray for today's message. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you right now and pause to thank you, Lord, for the teachings of your Holy Word. And Lord, I pray that you would re reveal to us once again this morning, Father, just how powerful and how loving you really are. And that no matter what we face in life, Lord, help us to just know that there's nothing too hard for you to deal with. So, Father, we pray that you'd open our eyes, that you'd open our ears, and open our minds to the deeper truths of your word. Use this message now and this messenger as you see fit. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 You know, when we, uh, when we look at the world around us with all of its trials and troubles and tribulations, uh, uh, a world with all kinds of heartaches and problems and calamities, it sometimes it becomes very easy to ask this question, you know, where is God in all of this? And why doesn't God just step in and do something about it? Well, why doesn't he just step in and just stop it? I mean, we'll ask, where is God when all the bad stuff is happening? We can look at our own lives and we tend to have one problem after another, it seems like. And sometimes it seems like even our problems have problems. And, and we wonder why God isn't moving in this. Why doesn't God do something to fix this? Why doesn't God help me in this? And then we begin to wonder, well, is God even able to do anything about it? Sometimes that's what follows. We begin to even question the ability of God to do anything about it. And we wonder, is the situation perhaps too big or too large or too strong or too complicated or too difficult for God to handle? Well, the title of today's message is, if you haven't seen it already, is There's Nothing Too Hard for God. There's nothing too hard for God. And uh, I want you to look at what the prophet Jeremiah said in, uh, in Jeremiah 32, 7. Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heaven and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for for you. Would you say that last phrase with me? Let's say it together. There is nothing too hard for you. Now what Jeremiah is saying there is, Lord, if you can make the universe, then you can do anything. After all, you made the heavens and the earth and all that's in them. You made all that, God. You know, we live on one of nine planets that circle our sun. And our sun, the sun which is 93 million miles away from us, can you even fathom that? 93 million miles away from us, our sun produces more energy in one second than mankind has produced in all of human history combined. And the sun is much larger than the earth. The sun is 800,000, they estimate, at least 800,000 miles in diameter. And the sun, if it were hollow, could hold about a million planets the size of earth. Just think about that, our planet, as big as it is, you could put a million of our planets inside the sun. And, uh, and our sun is just one of billions of suns of stars in the galaxy. And compared to other stars, our sun is basically a minor star. In fact, there is one star in our galaxy that gives off 10 million times the power generated by our sun. And that particular sun, star is so big that it could hold 1 million stars the size of our sun. Think about that. This sun, this particular sun is so big, you could put a million of our suns in that, which a million of our planets, planet Earths, fit inside that one sun. I mean, it's just mind-boggling to think about the enormity of the size of these things. And our galaxy stretches from rim to rim and is thousands of light years across, and that's with light traveling at 182,282 miles per second. And our galaxy, the Milky Way, is a relatively small galaxy, and God alone knows how many other galaxies there are in the universe, and God alone made them all. God just spoke them all into existence. Every star that's out there, God created, every single one. Look, look at the next verse on, on your outline there. It's Isaiah 40, 26. Isaiah said, Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. 
How many stars are there in the universe? How many? Nobody knows on earth, but God knows. And God not only knows the number, but God has named every single one of them. He calls them all by names, by the greatness of his might, because he is strong in power and not one is missing. In other words, not one fades without his, his knowledge. He knows where everyone is. God keeps all the stars in their order, including ours. Now, what Jeremiah was saying was, God, if you made the heavens and the earth and all of that, then it's obvious there's nothing too hard for you to do right here with me. The first point I want to get across to you today is this. I want us to think about, number one on your outline, I want us to look at the majesty of God's limitless power. The majesty of his limitless power. Now, Jeremiah gave us the answer in Jeremiah 32, 17. He gave us the answer. But in Genesis 18, 14, Abraham gave us the question. In fact, look at the next verse either on the screen or your outline. But Abraham asked, Abraham said, in this next verse, he said, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Now, actually, that was God's question to Abraham because God is telling Abraham he's going to have a son in his old age, and Abraham's a little skeptical about that. He's a little quizzical about that. And so God says, hey, Abraham, is anything too hard for me? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? Now, Jeremiah gives the answer. Jeremiah said there is nothing too hard for the Lord. So let me tell you some things that's not too hard for the Lord to do that maybe might benefit you and I this morning. Here's the next key thought on your outline. Now, I want you to know there is not a promise that is too hard for God to keep. There is not a promise that is too hard for God to keep. Now, I've never counted them all, but somebody has said that there are, there are like 30,000 plus promises in the Word of God, and every one of them is yes and amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, is, God will absolutely keep His Word. He absolutely will. In fact, look at the next verse on your outline there, Titus 1 and 2. It says, it says, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the time began. God who what? Say it again. God who what? Cannot lie. He cannot lie. It means he'll never lie. He won't lie. He doesn't lie. Lie is not in his vocabulary. He doesn't lie about anything. There is no promise in this book that God will not keep because he won't lie. He cannot lie. In other words, if he gave you a promise, guess what he's going to do? Keep it. He's going to keep it. Do you believe that? See, that's the question, isn't it? Do I really believe that? I hope you do, because there's not a promise in this book that's too hard for God to keep. And that includes his promise concerning the rapture of his church and his return to reign as king of kings upon this earth. His promise to do that very thing will absolutely be fulfilled because God cannot lie. And there is no promise that he makes that's too hard for him to keep. Remember, if he can create the universe, he can keep every promise he ever made to us. Amen? Amen. Folks, there's no promise too hard for God to keep. But that's not all. Here's the next key thought on your outline there. I also want you to know there is not a prayer that is too hard for God to answer. There is not a prayer that's too hard for God to answer. In fact, look at the, the next verse there on your outline or on the screen. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Call unto me, and I will what? Answer, answer you. Now, that's a promise. And remember what we said? He's not going to lie, so every promise he makes, he's going to what? Answer. Keep. He's going to keep every promise. He's going to answer it. So here's a prayer. If we pray, he says, if you call unto me in prayer, I'm going to answer you. He's going to fulfill that promise to you. He'll do that. You know, sometimes when a friend has a minor problem, we pray for our friend and ask God to handle that problem, whatever it is. We'll pray for them. We, we say that all the time to people. I'm going to pray for you. I'll pray for you. And so we shoot up a quick prayer to the Lord, trusting that God's going to take care of it. Don't we? We do that, don't we? As Christians, we do that. We pray for other people that way. But you know, sometimes we tend to sort of back away when things get really hard for somebody else. If it's a major problem, if it's a major health issue, if it's a death sentence, sometimes we back away from praying things that we would like to pray for, but we don't actually pray for them because we're afraid somehow that God might not be capable of doing it. That maybe God might not be capable of healing them because after all, this is a terminal disease or this is something that's so big or so difficult. And so we sort of say, well, I'll, I'll remember you in prayer, but we don't really pray the thing that we know we probably should be praying for because somehow we're afraid that God 
might not be big enough to answer that one. But what did Jesus say? Look at the next verse up on the screen there or on your outline, Matthew 22, 22. Jesus said, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. The key is believing. We really believe that nothing is too hard for God. Do we really believe that? All things, when you ask in prayer, believing, you're going to receive. Thou art coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring. For his power and grace are such, thou canst not ask too much. There is no prayer that's too hard for God to answer. And all God's people said, amen. amen. A pastor by the name of Adrian Rogers, a really great preacher, was in Moscow, Russia, getting ready to preach an evangelistic message outdoors. And this occurred shortly after the Soviet Union system had collapsed. And so here was this Baptist preacher in Red Square getting ready to preach to thousands of people there. In fact, his message was going to be, was going to be able to be televised on Russian television, if you can believe it. They were going to air it on Russian TV, and he was allowed to preach the gospel with no restraints. He was free to just preach the gospel. But before he could get up and preach, the weather started turning bad. And it happened rather quickly. I believe it was a demonic attack. And it was just coming because it came up so quickly and it started pouring rain. Soon word came down from the heads on high there in the Russian square that the event had to be canceled because of all the electrical wires on the ground. And those electrical wires, you know, for the TVs and the stage and all that kind of stuff would create a danger to people if it continued to rain. Now, this pastor and his team, they'd come thousands of miles from Texas. They'd come from thousands of miles to be able to preach there. And, and this was going to be their only shot at it. And so they begged the leaders to wait. They begged them to wait. And they said, the leaders said, look, I mean, they, they told the leaders, they said, look, we're ready to do this thing. It's all set up. It's ready to go. But the guy who was overseeing the, the whole thing there, the, the Russian uh, uh, representative said, look, I'll give you 10 minutes. And if it hasn't stopped raining in 10 minutes, it's over. We're not going to be able to do this, and it's just done. We're just going to shut it down. So this pastor and his team went to God in prayer because this is the only shot they were going to have at this. They went to God in prayer, and they prayed, and they said, Dear God, there's nothing too difficult for you. God, you see the clouds. You see the rain. God, you need to stop this rain so that we can preach. And they said, God, if you don't stop the rain in 10 minutes, they're going to shut us down. Please, God, please stop the rain. Seven minutes went by, and it's still raining, but they continued to pray. Eight minutes, it's still raining. They prayed more. Nine minutes went by, it's still raining. They didn't stop praying. Nine and a half minutes, it's still raining. And then exactly ten minutes later, it's as if God just turned off the water valve, and it was as dry as a bone, and then a bright blue sky appeared, and they went on with the program, and thousands of people got saved. Now, some might say, well, now, Pastor, that was just a coincidence. Well, I guess you could believe that if you want to. But I've seen God answer too many prayers in my own life to believe that it was merely a coincidence. Because God hears the prayers of his people when we pray in faith. And listen, there is no prayer too big or too hard for God to answer. If it's within his will and we're asking for it, God's going to do it. Sometimes it's within his will and all he's waiting for is for us to ask. He's just waiting for us to ask so we can see him do it. So we'll build, he'll build our faith in the process. And that brings me to the next key thought on your outline there because sometimes God allows these difficulties into our lives in order to build our faith. So listen, there is no problem too hard for God to solve. Let's write that in there. There's no problem too hard for God to solve. And this is one that I think some of you this morning probably need to hear. There is no problem that you face that is too hard for God to solve. Do you have a problem that seems insurmountable? Well, God specializes in overcoming the overwhelming. God specializes in that. Now, that doesn't mean that God will always solve your problems the way you want it solved, but he will solve it. Amen. Solve it, he will, amen? L look at what God says in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, the next verse on your outline there. God says, for my thoughts, check this out, this, li listen to this. He says, for my thoughts, this is God speaking to you this morning. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord, for... As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, when you were a little boy or a girl, did you ever wonder how high up was? Did you ever think about how high up was? I still wonder that. I mean, how far can you go before you reach the edge, the end, the outermost reaches, in infinity? How, how high do you have to go to do that? I, Isaiah asked, how high are the heavens above the earth? That's how high God's ways and God's thoughts are above our thoughts and ways. 
So therefore, God may not solve the problem the way you want to solve it, and God may not do it on the same timetable that you want it done on, and God may solve your problem using a different, different technique than the technique you would use. I mean, we can try to tell God how we think He ought to do it, but God's still going to do, the way, do it the way He wants to do it. Amen? It doesn't matter how we want to do it. His thoughts are above ours. His ways are above ours. He's going to do it His way, but He'll do it. He will get the job done. It just may not be the way you expect it to be done. I mean, I'm sure that when Saul, for example, you remember Saul in the New Testament when Saul was persecuting the Christian church? How Saul was hunting down Christians and putting them to death? I'm sure that at that time, when that was going on, that the church started praying, Oh, dear God, please strike Saul dead. I think I would pray that, don't you? I mean, if, I, if we knew that there was a government-sanctioned guy going around killing anybody who was a Christian, we would begin to say, God, kill him. Don't let him keep killing your people. Kill him, God. Take him out. Strike him dead. But you know what? God heard the prayers of his people and he answered them. But he did it differently than they expected because God didn't strike Saul dead. God struck him alive. Amen? Amen? He made him alive. And Saul became then the mighty apostle Paul. So God works in a different way than we might work. Listen, God has his ways of doing things despite our feeble attempts to do things our way. He has his particular way. I heard about a young farm boy who was sitting underneath a mighty oak tree and he looked up into the mighty oak tree and he saw all these tiny little acorns hanging off of these massive oak limbs. And then he looked out into his fields at his watermelon plants and he saw all these huge watermelons, heavy huge watermelons growing on these tiny little vines. And he said, you know, if I were God, I would have done things differently. If I were God, I would have put those tiny little acorns on those tiny little vines and those big watermelons on those strong limbs of the oak tree. That just makes more sense. But at that moment, an acorn fell off the tree and hit him in the head, and he said, I'm glad that wasn't a watermelon. <laughs> the point is God works in ways that are very different from ours, amen? But there's no problem. There's no problem you're facing this morning that's too hard for God to handle. I don't care what problem you're dealing with. I don't care how big it seems to you. I don't care how large it is. God is way bigger than it is. Amen. And God is able to handle it. Trust him. Trust him. Take it to him and let him handle it. He will. But then here's the next key thought on your outline. There, there is no person, and I love this one, there's also no person too hard for God to save. There is no person too hard for God to save. I love that. I mean, God can save anyone if they'll just come to him for salvation. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Look, look, look at the next verse there on the screen or on your outline there, Isaiah 118. It says, come now and let us reason together. Let's reason this thing out, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They can be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they can be like wool. Let's think this thing through. You know, I've seen God save some of the meanest people you'd ever meet. I mean some of the meanest, most ruthless people you've ever, you would ever know. God, I've seen God save them. Now, I've seen God save some really sweet people, and I've seen God save some really good people. But I've also seen God save some really terrible people as well. God can save anybody who will only be willing to humble themselves before him, confess their sin, repent of their sin, and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He'll save anybody who does that. Amen? Listen, there is no person that's too hard for God to save. That's what Jeremiah was saying. He's saying there's nothing too hard for the Lord to do. Say that one more time. There is nothing too hard for the Lord to do. God, you made the heaven and the earth, so there's nothing too hard for you to do. Now, that's just the majesty of God's limitless power. That's the majesty of it. But here's the second thing I want you to see today. Number two on your outline there. I also want you to see the mystery of man's limiting power. The mystery of man's limiting power. Now, what we just talked about, that's very encouraging. And it's very wonderful to know that. But I also need you to know that there are ways, things that we do that limit that power. There are things that we do that limit that power. God's limitless power and man's limiting power. Did you know that puny man can limit God's almighty power? Do you know that can happen? Sounds impossible, doesn't it? But it's true. Look at this next verse on your outline there, Psalm 78, 41. The psalmist is talking about the Israelites here and the children of God. And he says this, he says, Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Wait. They 
did that. They limited the Holy One of Israel. They, men, puny men, whose breath is in their nostrils, they turned back, they went back, they started heading back to Egypt, and they limited the Holy One of Israel. But there's nothing too hard for God. God can do anything, yes, yet they limited God. Now, the word limited here in the original Hebrew language means to set a horizon. Literally, what this means is that they horizoned the God of Israel. That's an interesting thought. They horizoned the God of Israel. That is that the horizon is as far as you can see. That's as far as you can see with your eyes. I mean, you go up on a tall building and you look out and the curvature of the earth falls away so that what's left is a horizon. It's called the horizon and it's a line. Now, if you're out in the ocean, this is really visible in the ocean. If, if you're standing by the ocean, if you go out to the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic and you look out over the ocean, you're going to see as far as you can see over the ocean, you're going to see what looks like a black line. It's almost like a black line that goes across the very end as far as you can see. You know what that is? That's where the earth begins to curve away. That's where it begins to fall away. It begins to curve right there. And that's as far as you can see. That's the horizon. That's the horizon. You know that there's more beyond that, but you can't see any further. That's the horizon. So what this verse is saying is that these people of Israel said, well, this is as far as we can see. This is as much as we can see that God can do. And so they limited God. They horizoned God. And so they gave up and they started to head back to where they were because they thought God can't do any more than he's already done. Puny man has the ability to limit God. And you know what? God allows this. God allows this to happen. You say, well, I thought, I thought God was almighty. Well, he is, but here's the thing and here's the mystery. The almighty allows himself to be bound. He allows himself to be bound. Let, let, me, let me give you an example. When Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, they came to arrest Jesus to judge him and to crucify him. Look at the next verse on your outline there, Matthew 27, 1 and 2. Look at what it says. It says, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. But now watch this. And when they had, what? Bound him. Wait. You know, there were times prior to this in the life of Jesus, in his ministry, when the people came against Jesus. Do you remember that time when they came against him and they said, let's take him and throw him over the cliff. Let's take him in stone. Remember that? And Jesus just walked right past them. Like, he, like they didn't even know he was there. Just walked right past them. Why couldn't they take him then? He didn't want to. Oh, and when they had bound him, they led him away to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Now, this is Jesus, the one who made the universe. And the Bible says that all things were made by him, and without him there is nothing made that was, that was made. This is God, a very God in human flesh, and yet they bound him. They handcuffed the Lord of glory. Now, that's an amazing thing. The, the very fact that Jesus Christ would allow himself to be bound and perp-walked, I mean, that's, that's an amazing thing. It wasn't that he didn't have control over the matter. I mean, Jesus didn't have to let them bind him. In fact, when the disciples wanted to defend the Lord and Peter pulled a sword, remember that? He pulled a sword and whacked off that soldier's ear. Remember that? But look at what Jesus ended up telling Peter in the next verse on your outline there, Matthew 26, 53. Jesus said, Peter said, Do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Jesus was saying, Peter, look, I don't need you to defend me. I don't need you to do that. Listen, there were 144,000 angels leaning over the rails of heaven with swords drawn just waiting for Jesus to give the word. It wasn't that Jesus was helpless and it wasn't that Jesus was overpowered, but rather it was just that Jesus allowed them to bind him. God allowed that to happen. The chief priests came and the temple guards came and Jesus just holds out his hands and there's no struggle. There's no fight. Jesus allows them to fetter him, to handcuff him, to bind him. And think about that. Think about the hands that were bound. Think about these hands that were healing hands. These hands that wanted to bless people. These hands that straightened crippled limbs. These hands that unstopped deaf ears and opened blinded eyes. His hands were hands that fed the multitudes. His hands were hands that raised the dead. His hands were omnipotent hands. There was nothing too hard for those hands. Nothing. And the one who could have called 12 legions of angels to set him free chose instead to let his own creation bind him. Now listen, my friend, listen. That's the mystery of man's limiting power. 
There's God's limitless power, but there's also man's limiting power. Now, let me just tell you today how that you, if you're not careful, and I, how that we can limit God in our lives if we're not careful. How we can bind the hands of the one who would love to bless us, but because we bind those blessing hands, we don't experience it. How can that happen in our lives? How can, how can we as puny man handcuff the blessing hands of God? In fact, here's the next key thought on your outline. Now, there are some things we do that can limit God's power in our lives. Here's letter A. First of all, just know that an unwilling spirit will limit God's power in our lives. An unwilling spirit will limit God's power in our lives. There is a passage of scripture that describes Jesus Christ as he's coming down from the Mount of Olives toward the city of Jerusalem. Halfway down, Jesus stops and he's riding on a little donkey and, and, and he stops on that donkey and, and Jesus just begins to weep. I mean, he just begins to cry. Big, salty tears begin to course down his cheeks. And Jesus, as he's weeping, he begins to, he begins to say this. Look, it's the next verse on your outline. In Matthew 23, 37, Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You were not willing. Do you see it? Jesus was willing, but they weren't. Jesus wanted to bless. Jesus would have reached down and blessed them tremendously. Jesus would have done so much for them, but they said no. No thanks. They bound Jesus' hands, hands that wanted to bring peace and hope and comfort and salvation for the people. Jesus said, Jerusalem, I would have blessed you. I would have done so much for you. But you said no, you were unwilling. Listen, Jesus wants to do so much for you, but you've got to be willing. You have to be willing. Listen, did you know that there are people who are not saved, that God wants to save, but they're not saved only because they're unwilling to be saved? Sometimes at the end of a message, I'll give an invitation depending on who's here and the situation. And, and many times I'll give an invitation and invite people to, to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Sometimes I'll just give the invitation to please come and accept Christ. But you know what? If that person is not willing, there's not enough angels in heaven or out of heaven to get them to come forward and accept Jesus into their heart and life if they're not willing. You know, in the early, early times of our nation's history, there was a man named George Wilson he was sentenced to death because of some crimes that he had done. And he was sentenced to death and he was to be hung by the neck. But some people went to the governor of the state and pleaded for his, this man's life. And there was extenuating circumstances. So they pled for his life and they said, please don't hang this man, George Wilson. Well, the governor was moved by their pleas for mercy. And so he wrote a pardon for this man. The pardon was sent to the prison warden. The prison warden read it and thought that George Wilson would be so glad to receive that pardon. Thought he'd be so happy to get that pardon. They went to George Wilson and they read the pardon to George Wilson. And yet, you know what? In his pride, George Wilson said, I don't want the pardon. I don't want it. And they said, what do you mean? He said, I don't accept the pardon. And then he said, you got to carry out the sentence. Go ahead, hang me. you got to do it. Well, they didn't know what to do. They had a legal problem. I mean, here's a man who was given a pardon, but he didn't want to receive it. So they thought, well, should we just force him out of prison or should we continue on with the hanging? So they sent it to the high Supreme Court. The high court adjudicated it this way. They said the pardon is rendered invalid and the man must be hanged because he refuses the pardon. And George Wilson was hanged by the neck until he was dead because he was unwilling. Unwilling to receive what was freely given to him. Jesus said, I would have blessed you, Jerusalem, but you were unwilling. You just didn't want to take it. You know, there's some people who believe in what's called irresistible grace. And that's a belief that if God is going to save you, he's going to save you whether you want him to or not. But that's a faulty viewpoint because God has given you and I the privilege, the dubious, the dubious privilege of being able to say no to the Lord. Now, it's true that you can't be saved unless the Lord draws you to himself. He puts that faith in your heart and he draws you by his power. It's true that that needs to take place, but you still have to be willing to go. You still have to be willing to succumb to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. God has limitless power, but man has limiting power. And so an unwilling spirit can tie the hands of Jesus in your life. But I'll tell you something else that can tie the hands of Jesus. Here's letter B. An unconcerned attitude will limit God's power in our lives. An unconcerned attitude will do that. It's not just being unwilling, but it's being indifferent to the whole thing. 
You know, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, the Lord Jesus is talking to the church at Laodicea. And by the way, an unconcerned attitude, indifference to the whole thing, certainly describes the church at Laodicea, the, the church that's going to be primarily in existence in the last days. I think that very well describes the church that's in existence today, an indifferent church in many ways. Amen? I mean, when we look around, there's a lot of indifference in the church today. But the Lord Jesus is talking to this church and how he describes himself there. It's on your outline. And here's how he describes himself. Revelation 3.20. He says, as he's talking to this church, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'm going to come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, Jesus has limitless power. So do you think that there's any door that could possibly keep the Lord of glory from opening it? No. If Jesus really wanted to open a door, he'd just open it. He'd knock it down. He'd blow it away. He'd call it into, he'd just, he'd just evaporate it with a word or he'd just pass through it like he did in the upper room. He'd just go right through locked doors. It doesn't matter. And yet here we have in the Bible, Jesus knocking. He's standing at the door and he's knocking. Holman Hunt has painted a picture of this. I'm sure you've seen it. It's a picture of Jesus standing at a door. He's standing at this door. He's holding a lantern in one hand and he's knocking with the other. And there's vines grown over the door. I mean, he's been there knocking so long that vines have grown over the door, that it's grown that way. Now, someone is on the inside, and Jesus wants to come in, but if you look at Holman Hunt's painting, you're going to find that there's no doorknob on the outside. It's because the only doorknob is the one that's on the inside. So evidently, the person on the inside can hear the knocking, but they're so unconcerned that they don't even open the door. They won't even open the door. Now, I hate to say it, but I've seen, and I've been preaching long enough to know that for some people, preaching is like pouring water over a rock. I mean, that's about all it means to them. Because yeah, a lot of folks just aren't concerned. Jesus is knocking at their heart's door and he wants to come in and have fellowship with them. But they limit the Holy One of Israel. And this happens to Christians all the time. I mean, the church at Laodicea, he's talking to a church. He's talking to those who profess Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they won't let him in. They won't let him in. Christians who have become apathetic in their faith do this. They limit the power of God. There's no excitement about God in their life anymore. There's no excitement about the Bible or Bible study anymore or church or worship. There's no excitement about that anymore in their life. And so they limit God in their lives. They, they're binding the hands of God because there's no, there's no joy or energy in their life anymore. They become apathetic. See, I don't know how much of God you have, but I can tell you this much. You have as much of Jesus as you want. And if you don't have any more, it's because you don't want any more. Yeah. Jesus wants you, but you can be so unconcerned and indifferent that you bind his hands. But I'll tell you another way that we can limit the Holy One of Israel, not only by an unwilling spirit and unconcerned attitude, but here's letter C, an unreasonable mindset will limit God's power in our lives as well. An unreasonable mindset. There are some people who are so unreasonable that they don't reason things out logically. They don't, they don't have a mind of reason. But there's some people who are so unreasonable that their lack of reason really handcuffs the Lord Jesus. That's the reason that the Bible says what it says in Isaiah 1, 18 and 19. Look at it. It says, come now, let us, we said, we read it already, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. But then he says, if ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good fruit of the land. The blessings will be yours. They'll be yours. But if you refuse to think things through biblically, godly, properly, if you refuse to use the God-given ability to be reasonable and then with reason be willing and obedient, then you can handcuff the Lord and your sins will remain as scarlet and you'll never be white as snow because you'll not come and be reasonable with the Lord. Listen, have you ever really listened to someone, have you really listened to some of the unreasonable ways that some people think and act and talk when it comes to spiritual things? Have you ever gotten a conversation with somebody and you've heard their reasoning? I mean, for example, if you go to somebody and, uh, and you say, would you like to come to church? And, and, and they'll say, no. You say, well, why? And they might say something like this. They'll say, well, you know, when I was little, my mom made me go to church all the time. So I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to go anymore because my mom made me do it when I was little. Well, I also bet that his mother made him take a bath when he was a little boy as well. And I hope for everybody else's sake he's still doing it as an adult. Amen? 
I mean, I, I've told people that, too. I mean, somebody says, well, you know, I was a little boy. You know, I was a little girl. My mom, they dragged us to church all the time and everything. And I said, oh, really? And he said, yeah, so we don't have any desire to go today. And I said, did your mom also make you take a bath or a shower? Well, yeah, of course she did. You still do it today? Yeah, why? Because it was good for you. So going to church is good for you. Amen. But you got to have reason to think that way, right? you got to have a reasonable mind. Um, somebody else might say, well, there's a bunch of hypocrites down at the church. That's why I don't want to go to the church. There's a bunch of hypocrites there. Well, do tell. Folks, I, I tell you, there are hypocrites in every area of life. I mean, you can buy a dozen eggs and one of them is going to be a hypocrite. I mean, it's true. Listen, some lawyers are shysters. Amen? It's true. Some lawyers are sh shysters. Some doctors are quacks. Some money is counterfeit. And yet, if you're in trouble with the law, you're still going to find a lawyer, aren't you? Even though some of them are shysters. And if you're sick, you're still going to find a doctor, even though some of them are quacks, right? And I'll bet you that you haven't burned up all of your remaining cash simply because you've discovered that there are some counterfeit bills out there. Listen, you, you know that the hypocrite only proves the validity and the worth, worthwhileness of the true believer. That's what a hypocrite does. Why do men counterfeit $100 bills and why don't they counterfeit gum wrappers? Well, it's because one is certainly worth more valuable than the other one. Amen? One's a lot more valuable. See, it's the counterfeit that pays tribute to the real. Every hypocrite is a testimony to the validity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to the reality that there are real Christians who strive not to be hypocritical. In other words, there wouldn't be so many phony Christians out there if there weren't great value and validity in true Christianity. Or somebody else might say, oh, I'd like to be a Christian, but there's so much that I'd have to give up. I just don't think I can give up all the things that God would want me to give up. Well, the only things God's asking you to give up are the things that's going to hurt you, the things that are hurting you. That's all God's asking you to give up, the stuff that's hurting you. It's like somebody saying, well, I want to be healed, but I don't want to give up my cancer. Well, that's just stupid, amen? Well, so are the reasons for not going to church, the reasons for not listening to God and coming to Christ. See, what I'm trying to say is that if you have an unreasonable mindset, you can use silly, superficial, and worldly reasoning and say no to God. But when you stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment and realize that you have handcuffed the Lord with an unreasonable spirit and your sins, therefore, are still like scarlet when they could have been white as snow, you're going to say, what a fool I've been. What a fool I've been. But folks, listen, man can limit God. You can limit God by unwillingness. You can limit God by unconcern. You can limit God by being unreasonable. But here's another way you can limit God. Letter D on your outline there. You can do it. An unclean lifestyle will limit God's power in our lives. An unclean lifestyle will do that. An unclean lifestyle will limit God's power in our lives. Did you know that if you harbor sin in your life, then you've limited God and kept God from, listen, answering your prayers. Now, listen, remember we said there's no prayer too hard for God to answer. Amen? No prayer too hard for Him to answer. But we can limit that answer because we're remaining in sin. We can, we can limit that. We can stop that from happening. Look at the next verse, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So what's he saying? Has God failed to answer prayer because he's weak? Has God failed to hear your prayer because his ear is heavy? And so God says, eh, what, what did you say? I can't hear you. Uh, can you say a little louder, please? No. God is well. God's doing just fine. God's ear is keen. He hears everything. He hears every breath you take. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. Amen? Amen? But one thing that can tie the hands of God, one of the reasons your prayers won't get answered is because your unconfessed sin has separated you from God and your iniquities have hid His face from you. Listen, when we do that, we have limited the Holy One of Israel. Uh, let me put it this way. We also do that by refusing to let go of that particular sin. We hang on to a particular sin, that, and, and, it, and, and it's that sin that creates that unclean lifestyle. We refuse to let go of that one particular pet sin that we just hang on to. I heard about a little girl who got her hand stuck in a vase and they couldn't get it out. They used soapy water and grease and everything they could to get her hand out of the vase. 
So finally, in desperation, they took a mallet, they broke the vase, and in her chubby little hand was a penny that she refused to let go of. She kept on holding to that penny rather than letting go of it in order to be free. What is it that you might be holding on to? What is it that keeps you from being really free? Is it really worth, as you hang on to that thing, is it really worth losing your connection with God over? Is it really worth not getting your prayers answered? Is it really worth limiting Jesus in your life? Is it worth handcuffing, handcuffing the Lord so that He can't bless you like He wants to? Listen, I don't think it's worth any of that. Not at all. But it's true that an unclean lifestyle can limit the Lord. Let go. Let go of it so God can do what He wants to do. There's nothing too hard for God to do. We just got to let Him do it. Amen? Amen. Got to let Him do it. But there's one more thing I want to bring to your attention. One more thing that may handcuff the hands that want to bless you. Letter E. It's an unbelieving heart will limit God's power in our lives. An unbelieving heart will limit God's power in our lives. And frankly, folks, listen, i got to tell you, this is the culmination of all the others. Now, all sin is terrible, but the worst sin, the father of all sin, the mother of all sin, the worst sin of all is unbelief. That's the worst one of all. Unbelief is devastating. Listen, Jesus was raised in Nazareth. Now, we know he was born in Bethlehem, amen? Born in Bethlehem, but he was raised in Nazareth. He was a son of Nazareth. Born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth. But look at what the Bible says in this next verse on your ally, Matthew 13, 58. It says this, And he did not many mighty works there. Where? In Nazareth. Because of what? Their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. Could Jesus do mighty works? Absolutely. Did Jesus have miracle working hands? Absolutely. Was there anything too hard for him to do? Absolutely not. And yet the Bible says he didn't do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now listen, folks, faith and belief is the channel by which the risen Lord pours his life into you and I. That's the message to you and I today. Really, it's just a message of two points. Very simple. There's the majesty of God's limitless power, which means there's no prayer too hard for God to answer. There's no promise too hard for God to keep. There's no person too hard for God to save. Some of you need to hear that. I know some of you have family members you've been praying for for salvation. Keep praying. Don't stop. There's no prayer too hard for God to answer. There's no person too hard for God to save. Amen? Amen. Don't you quit. Don't you stop. You keep asking God for their salvation. You keep praying. We never thought Cindy's mom would ever accept the Lord. Cindy never gave up praying. And the last time she was out there before her mom passed away, she was able to lead her to the Lord. God answered that prayer. Amen? Amen. There's no prayer too hard for God to answer. No person too hard for God to save. And there's no problem too hard for God to solve. No problem. So there's nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing too difficult for God to do. However, the only thing that lies outside God's power is that which lies outside of His will. And that's the fact that we can limit God by our, our unwillingness, by our unconcern, by our unreasonableness, by our uncleanness, and by our unbelief. Those are the things that can limit the power of God in your life. It doesn't mean you're going to limit the power of God in anybody else's life. It doesn't mean you're going to limit the power of God in the life of the church or in the life of the world. God's power is still going to be on display for everybody to see. All you have to do is look up in the night sky. Amen? Amen. His power is still evident everywhere, but you can limit God's power in your personal life. And what a tragedy, what a shame that is when God so personally wants to impact you in a way that would just liberate you and do amazing things in your life. I believe that it is a very foolish person who binds the blessed hands of Jesus, the very hands that want to bless you. Remember, there's nothing too hard for God to do. We just need to let Him do it and stop limiting Him. No problem too hard for God to solve. No problem. No difficulty. Whatever you're facing right now, whatever challenge is before you, financial, relational, whatever, whatever the issue, there's no problem you're facing too hard for God to solve. I can't let go of this sin. Yes, you can. By the authority of Jesus Christ, you can let it go. You can release it. Just trust God more than you. Just lean on Him more than you're leaning on yourself. Come to the end of yourself. Let that stuff die. 
it doesn't need to be a part of you anymore. You're a new creature in Christ. You have a new destiny, a new purpose. Let God fulfill that in your life. Don't hold back. Let go of those things that you know God is, is not pleasing to God. You know it in your heart. You know it in your mind. Let it go. Release it. Believe God. Trust Him. He'll take it from you. There's no problem too hard that He can't solve. No issue you face too difficult that He can't deliver you from. There's nothing that is too hard for God. Nothing. I, I trust God with the finances of our church because I know God and I know you. I know God. I've seen you respond to God. I've seen you listen to God. I've seen it happen over and over again. For the past 30 years, I've seen that happen over and over again. Why would I stop trusting God now? Why would I even consider doing that? God takes care of us. We can believe Him and trust Him and lean on Him. Amen? And you know, sometimes He'll let us get right up to the brink of the darkest night, the darkest moment of our lives, and then all of a sudden, there He is. And you go, God, I, I, I wasn't sure you were going to show up. And God goes, why not? Why weren't you sure of that? Are you sure now? I'm here. Yeah, I'm sure now, God. What about the next time? Are you going to believe me the next time it happens? Uh, yeah, but does it have to go so far? Well, now it does because you're not going to, you're not, you know, right? Do you, you understand? God wants us to learn, but he wants us to learn to just trust him no matter what. You have to die to self and lean wholly on Him. Take up your cross and follow Him. You'll never go in the wrong direction if you follow Him. Amen? Amen. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Trust Him no matter what you face. I wish I could tell you that dark days are done. I wish I could tell you that, that things are going to be rosy and great for the rest of your life now and America is just going to be turn around and just do amazing things. But folks, I don't know if you've noticed, if you've been listening to the news... Though on one hand, things are looking better in some ways, it's just getting darker in others. And the intensity of the battle, the intensity of the spiritual warfare that's being engaged in America right now is, is beyond anything we've ever seen before. Look, I, I'm going to tell you this, and, and just mark my words, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, is there going to be civil war in America? Look, we're beyond the dissension that existed for civil war when it first occurred. The dissension that caused civil war, the North between the South, many years ago, that bloody war that was, the things that caused the dissension then, we're well past that. We're past that kind of dissension. Is there gonna be civil war that's violent? It's already here. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but there's all kinds of violence occurring everywhere. There's all kinds of violent things happening. But you know what? We're believers in Christ. We're not going to engage in that, amen? We're not going to engage in violence. We're going to trust God. We're going to lean on God. We're going to depend on God. We're going to, we're going to let God do what God wants to do. I think there are tough times ahead, yes. And I think for you, I think there's going to be some difficult things too. Don't ever let up. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Look up. Pray up. Get ready to go up because he's coming back soon, amen? But keep your eyes on Jesus and do what he's told us to do. If you do that, believing and trusting, huh, there's nothing we can't accomplish. There's nothing we can't do. Keep your eyes off the world. Keep your eyes on God. Believe him. Trust him. He's never failed us and he never will, amen? Hey, death comes to everybody sooner or later. That's going to happen. Death comes. It does come. But that's not the end of the church, and it's not the end of the person who dies who's a Christian. Amen? We just keep marching on. They, they just beat us to heaven. But we keep marching on and keep doing what God's called us to do. For one reason or another, he's left us here. Let's keep serving him. Amen? Amen. To the glory of God. There's nothing, nothing too hard for God to do. That's good news. Would you stand with me and let's pray together. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we want to pause right now to just give you thanks for your word. Thanks for the truths that are in it. Father, there is so much more we could talk about in relationship to, to what you do for us, for your power in our lives, and for the majesty and glory of your limitless power. It is it's seen in everything, everywhere. We just sort of picked a few things to talk about this morning. 
But Father, help us to just see your power and majesty every day. We get out of bed to recognize that you're God, that you've given us another day, you've given us another breath, you've given us another opportunity to serve you. Lord, help us never to take that for granted. Help us, Father, to always be ready to serve you with a willing spirit. Father, help, help us not to be unwilling and help us not to be unconcerned and help us not to be unreasonable, but to just, just think things through with your mind. And help us to be sin-free so that there's no uncleanness in us and, and that we might confess our sin to you and just be free of that consistently, Father. Deliver us. And Father, for that person who needs deliverance from a particular sin this morning, set them free right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, help them to trust you right now. Help them to just lay that sin at the altar right now and be set free. Father, just remove any unbelief. Father, help us to just believe you and trust you because, Lord, we know there's nothing too hard for you to do. Nothing. No problem in this room right now that's too difficult for you to solve. No prayer too hard for you to answer. You've made some promises today, Lord, to us, and there's no promise too hard for you to keep. I know some folks in here, Father, you've made personal promises to them. We know, Lord, you're going to keep it. We're not going to doubt that. We're going to trust that. There's no person too hard for you to save. So we keep praying for our loved one's salvation and people we know who need to be saved. There's nothing, nothing too difficult for you, God. Would you just say that to him right now in prayer? Just say, Lord, I know that there's nothing. Just from your heart, just say, Lord, I know there's nothing too difficult for you. Just tell him that. And just thank him for it. Praise him. And now, God, we surrender this time to you, Lord. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for delivering us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said.